post about what we do in our everyday lives, things we like, things we dislike, uh, things we hate. Even though there's not a dislike button in Facebook, you can still you know, post things about stuff you don't like. Um, but most importantly, the interaction or the exchange of something to be shared is what binds us together. You know, a Facebook update that doesn't have any content about yourself or something that you like or dislike is very boring. So in a way, you can say that the sharing of, of knowledge about yourself and the sharing of a, a file or a piece of data is not really that different. And that's also why file sharing is such a common practice today. You know, people don't differentiate between sharing a piece of information about themselves and sharing a file. It's basically, you know, all of it is data. That's also why the, the line between what is legal and illegal is so blurred. Especially for a youth, like, uh, it's, uh, I can understand how it's hard for a child to understand why is it legal to go on YouTube and watch, uh, you know, any video I want when it's not uh, legal to download it and share it with a friend or if I have this file, uh, share that directly with a friend. Where's the distinction? Like streaming something is actually downloading. It's just the software that prohibits you from taking that data into another piece of software. But it's pretty much the same. And this sharing thing, which is the relation between uh, ourselves and our friends in the social media, is the mechanism that we thought, this is the, this is the, the building block to create a label. This is the way to uh, appeal to music fans and to, to ensure that w the music that we would be providing would enter into the channels uh, where people's attention is, where people's daily lives uh, take place, the sharing. But this is where it gets a bit tricky because sharing music is, uh, is rather complicated. The thing is that you probably all know that um, you know, such thing as copyrights prohibit um, the, 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 the free exchange of music without a, a, a financial or economic compensation. But a um, little over 10 years ago, uh, a guy in, uh, in the United States uh, a law professor named Larry Lessig came up with a, a new idea, something called Creative Commons. Uh, creative Commons is basically um, a way for a creator to differentiate your copyright. Um, copyright is different in all countries, but the basic idea is that when you create something, you own the full rights for the exploitation of that piece of, of creation. Could be a song, could be a movie, could be a book, could be a text photo or whatever. But basically, you, are, you own all the rights. So if other people want to use or enjoy or uh, pass on this, uh, this piece of work, then they have to get your permission. And that's a good idea. Like, uh, copyright uh, in its uh, basic idea is, is a good idea because uh, it uh, ensures that, that people cannot exploit your, your works uh, in a way that you as a creator uh, does not approve of. Still, uh, with the internet and the whole sharing uh, culture that I talked about just before, there's a huge uh, dissonance, a huge conflict between how it's, um, it's uh, against the law to share freely without the permission of creator, but at the same time, the sharing mechanism is what lays the, 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 the foundation for the way we interact with our friends online today. And that is why Creative Commons is such a, an amazing idea. Basically, what Creative Commons does is not to ex, uh, replace your, your uh, copyright, but basically put an extra layer on top of it. So uh, in order to use a Creative Commons license, which is free, these are free tools, uh, you basically go in and say, OK, instead of, of uh, having to choose between uh, letting people exploit my works entirely without uh, you know, my uh, consent or my, uh, my approval, which is what is referred to as giving something to the public domain uh, on one hand, and on the other hand, keeping all my rights and thereby making it illegal for my fans to share my works, then what Creative Commons does is, is put itself right in the middle and say, how about if we let creators uh, distinguish between different kinds of uses? Because basically, 
uh, there's a big difference between, for instance, uh, a young person in uh, South America downloading a song and giving it to one of his friends, uh, as compared to a big radio station playing a song. There's a big difference between that, that kind of use. But basically, uh, copyright in its, uh, in its original form says that either way, they have to ask you for permission and you have to negotiate a price. But as a creator, sometimes it can be a good idea, I think, and believe, to actually not have to approve every single kind of use. Because that way, I mean, if everybody had to ask first, imagine how many, uh, you know, how, how many emails and phone calls you'd get every day if you have a famous band. Like everyone calling, is it okay I download your song? And you go like, yeah, sure, that's okay. Uh, the next one calling, is that okay? Yeah, like, is it for radio? No, yeah, okay, that's okay. Like, it would be a lot of work. Um, so basically, the idea is with Creative Commons, when you put that on, 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 on an, as an extra layer on your copyright, you can distinguish between, for instance, commercial use and non-commercial use. So that uh, you know, some kid in South America downloading a song would often be uncommercial, whereas a radio station would be commercial. So um, with copyright and music, um, all countries have uh, what is called a collecting society, or most countries have. Here in Germany, it's GEMA. In uh, Denmark, it's called CODA. Uh, and it works pretty much the same way. It's basically an organization where musicians can uh, get a membership, and then um, the organization will take care of ne the negotiations for them. Basically, um, negotiate with radios and whoever wants to uh, use music, collect the money from that compensation, and then give it to the artist. Um, basically a good idea, but uh, with Creative Commons, it gets a little more complicated because all of a sudden Creative Commons um, um, uh, requires this, um, this uh, organization to uh, not uh, charge money for every kind of use, but only, for instance, the commercial use. That is why a lot of collecting societies all over the world have said, okay, we will not allow our members to use Creative Commons because it gets too complicated. Luckily though, there are a few countries that have adopted Creative Commons licenses. And Denmark, where I'm from, is one of them. Um, so back in 2008, in January, we, uh, we were waiting, uh, Suna and I and our artists, for the, for the adoption of the Creative Commons licenses in Denmark to become official. And when that happened, we released the Tone album two days after, thereby uh, actually being the first uh, album in the world to have a Creative Commons license while still being supported by a collecting society. And that turned out to be rather big news uh, because not only did we do this, uh, and also producing uh, vinyls and CDs and putting them in stores, but in order to, uh, to really charge the idea that we wanted to do something new and reach people uh, through new ways, we actually put on the back of the records, please copy this record to all of your friends. Which, especially back in 2008, was a, um, a complete opposite of what was pretty much on any other major label uh, album. If you turned it around, it says, piracy is a crime, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we went in the other direction and said, we look at it differently. We want this music to spread, so we want you to uh, share the music with, with your friends. Um, the, the basic idea of this uh, concept is uh, not a, a, a charity. The idea is, with this uh, business concept, is to reach as many people as possible, and thereby um, getting a reputation, and then build a business on top of that reputation. Now this is different than, uh, than conventional music business. I used to work for many years in the established music business where it's very different because the idea is that in order for a music fan to obtain a song they like, they have to pay up front before being able to enjoy it. The idea behind this label is instead, make sure people hear the song without charging and then building a relationship on that. Because a lot of the time, people are you know, curious to watch music, but don't know if they want to pay for it. That's why, they, that's why they pirate. Like They download a lot of songs, check them out, and delete the ones they don't like. And um, from, a, from a, like a conventional music business uh, perspective, that is often seen as a failed business. 
Like if you cannot extract compensation from that first uh, relation between uh, the artist and the fan, you know, then the business is lost. Well, we think uh, completely different. We say if we have a relation, if people like the music, then the business should be built on that relationship, and uh, and uh, and the, the extraction of profit should be volunteer. Like it, should, it shouldn't be forced to have uh, music fans pay. They should try it out and see if they like it, and then you build a business from that. So, uh, these kinds of statements, especially back in 2008, are very controversial. Um, because all of a sudden you had a record label, which in many music fans' uh, perception uh, seemed evil. Like you, Usually labels are seen as evil, bands are seen as good. So we wanted to change that with a label that was also good. And this uh, ended up uh, attracting... There we go. Attracting a lot of attention. Um, the bit on the screen here is, uh, is the national news in Denmark, which uh, um, made a, seg a segment about uh, this weird le record label that went uh, completely upstream uh, compared to the other record labels. Uh, so they interviewed the chairman of the, the Danish Record Label Association, IFPI, and he thought it was a horrible idea and something that could never work. Um, the story was also picked up uh, in many countries around Europe, uh, also in the US. This uh, weird uh, record label that uh, inspired their, um, their customers to pirate the music, to copy the music. Um, the good thing though was that um, not only did uh, the press uh, talk about this, uh, this story, they also uh, actually listened to the music. Um, and um, luckily, they, they really enjoyed the music. Even though this is niche music, this is experimental uh, electronic music, uh, all of a sudden, the Tone album started getting uh, uh, tons of reviews, like five stars, six stars sometimes. Um, like really going into, uh, into the right magazines, into the right blogs and so forth. And the thing about the Creative Commons license was that um, blogs, like the blogosphere, who are usually uh, um, very scared of including music on their websites, uh, could now all of a sudden see the uh, Creative Commons license and see, okay, I can actually post the music with my review. Which meant that other blogs that follow the big ones can listen to the music and decide, okay, we want to review this album as well, pick up the music, put it on their blog. That meant that, that um, the, the music spread like a, like a, like a viral, like a meme. Uh, and uh, these are just some uh, clips from, uh, from a lot of the, the blogs. Um, the result was, if we go back to the, to the TV bit that we're seeing on national television, which has, uh, Denmark is a small country of five million people but there's roughly one million viewers of the news. So uh, we, were, we sat uh, waiting by the server to see uh, how many people will actually you know, see the news bit and go online and uh, download the music. And um, the server just uh, went nuts. Uh, after approximately six or seven minutes, we had more than 6,000 downloads, and then the server crashed, which was horrible because um, usually you have to really take advantage of the 15 minutes of fame when you get them. But uh, our server was way too small. However, um, by then we were actually aided by a very nice Swedish person. Uh, we don't know who he was, but uh, what he did was that he made a torrent of the album and put it on Pirate Bay. We hadn't thought of that back then in 2008. But what happened was then that everyone was directed um, to the torrent site, the Pirate Bay, which is usually hunted by the music business, the conventional music business for piracy, but in this case was the perfect tool. We wanted to reach as many people as possible to build a relation, and through the Pirate Bay we could do that. Uh, we have no uh, records of how many downloads were actually uh, made from the Pirate Bay in the next days, in the next weeks and months, but it's a lot because all of a sudden uh, we started getting a lot of uh, requests from uh, festivals, uh, music venues, uh, all over Europe, uh, even in the US. Um, people who would have never come across a tiny uh, artist from Denmark that nobody knows about, uh, but was all of a sudden on all the music blocks everywhere, small blocks, small blo uh, big blocks, magazines and everything, 
So uh, we started to tour all over Europe. We toured uh, in the US and so forth, and having all these opportunities. Uh, additionally, a label from Berlin approached us because they wanted to license the album and send it, uh, distribute it all over Europe. Um, so all these opportunities came because the music, of course, was available and all of a sudden easy for music fans, blogs and so forth to, uh, to present and, and spread in their networks. Uh, we, had a, we had a marketing budget of zero. Like no advertisement, no nothing. We had no resor resources in that direction whatsoever. But we didn't need any because music fans like to spread music and they like to share music, they like to... Um, to uh, you know, be the one to find uh, great new music and so forth. So all people's networks uh, and their networks' networks all of a sudden became the distribution channel and marketing channel for, uh, for this album. Um, yeah. And this is all really nice, really good, and uh, you're probably all thinking, well, you know, where does the business come into it? And the business that I talked about before uh, our idea was to build on top of the relation, like first establish the relation, but then build a business. Because um, it is proven that we still use, uh, like as a music fan, you still use uh, money on music. It's just a different kind of uh, music that you buy. Like now you go to a concert and, and, and pay for that, or um, like buy a vinyl record, for instance, if you want that, uh, if the, the digital file is not enough for you. So uh, we had also prepared ourselves for that, of course. Um, so we made all these different kinds of products that were available immediately when the blogosphere started to, uh, to really buzz around this, uh, around this new act. So um, not only were we ready, to, we had a, a live performance uh, ready to, uh, to tour in Denmark and abroad. We also had uh, vinyl records, really nice uh, gatefold uh, vinyl records that even had DVDs uh, with uh, live visuals on it. We also had um, all this uh, merchandise. I'm wearing one now. It's kind of old, it's from 2008, but, uh, but also uh, tote bags, hoodies, whatever. And then of course, when you reach a certain level in popularity, there's also a demand for what is called synchronization which is basically a commercial uh, organization wanting to buy the rights to use your music in a you know, campaign or advertisement and so forth. So even though like, the money pile is a stock photo, it's not our pile. But, uh, but nevertheless, we had a lot of requests for synchronization. And this is where the business part comes into it because all these products, of course, cost money for people to obtain but it's something that people engage in voluntarily and thereby not something that we force upon people. We use the files to reach as many people as possible and then we uh, sell products to a small percentage. So it's all a matter of scale. Like if you reach 100,000 people and uh, will be able to do business with 2,000 of those, you know, then that's a platform. And if you scale that up to reaching maybe 400,000 people, you know, then the scale of business um, uh, enlarges and in that case um, we don't worry about all the downloads that we don't make money from but rather see them as a statistical chance to reach a person uh, with whom we can actually do business if that person chooses to do business with us and this proved very successful like I said we we uh, been touring heavily um, now it's 2012, we've been releasing uh, albums ever, ever since with the same, uh, same uh, business model. Not only Tone, but also other uh, bands in the roster. Um, but uh, for, for this uh, first one, as you can see here on the map, we've, uh, we've been around the world uh, quite a lot doing, uh, doing concerts. And um, um, in fact, uh, we also had a, a US record label deal uh, offered at some point. Uh, which didn't work out in the end, but nevertheless, uh, it shows that if you, uh, if you make yourself available and reach as many people as possible, then all these opportunities for business, but also for a further building of the reputation uh, of the band uh, will, uh, will come along and you can then, uh, you know, scale up. Okay. I want to mention as well another thing, this is kind of a side story. Um, because another thing we did was uh, in creating this uh, label was also to look at the distribution side of things. As a small label, it's really hard to get a distribution deal. 
distribution uh, distributors are these big companies that um, bring records from uh, the record label stock out into the stores. Uh, and th as I said, this is really difficult. But the idea we had was to create a collective of, of small labels uh, from the idea that that a swarm of labels can constitute a big entity, uh, which will be interesting for uh, record stores to uh, to do business with. So uh, alongside um, the uh, the digital side of things, we also went ahead and created our own distribution system in Denmark. It's probably easier because it's a small country, but nevertheless, uh, the label collective ended up being uh, close to 80 small Danish labels uh, under one umbrella in one roster, um, which was called uh, the label collective. So not only looking at the digital side of things, but also looking at the physical side of distributing records uh, was part of this concept. Okay, so um, the bottom line of all this is of course um, sharing. Sharing is, uh, like I said in the beginning, the basis of pretty much uh, all our relations online, regardless of, of what we share. And therefore, I think that you know, in order to create a business concept for a record label, it's really important to not work against this very strong force of sharing. Like the, trying to, to, to work against the internet and people's uh, common behavior it's just not the right way to go if you wanna if you wanna create something that's sustainable. Um, now, what we did and what we're doing is uh, is niche music. It's a it's a small part of, of the music business that we're working with, because the the music does not appeal to uh, to a lot like to a mainstream audience. Uh, still, what I would love to see was to have this model or something similar applied to a mainstream band. Like some huge artist that t take the chance and say, okay, I'm, I'm being pirated anyway, why not turn things around and create something where I have a positive relation with those people who like my music and want to help me by sharing and spreading the knowledge of my music to all their friends. We haven't seen that yet, like the, the huge mainstream artist uh, doing that, but uh, there are actually other, uh, other cases uh, that um, are very similar to what we have done, but on a much larger scale, um, which also proves that the, the, the scaling that I talked about before is actually real. Um, I don't know if you know the band Nine Inch Nails. It's an American uh, hard rock industrial band uh, with a lot of success. Um, the guy, uh, the second from the right, is Trent Reznor. He's the he's the lead singer, and uh, he's a very uh, forward-thinking guy. Um, if you aren't following him on Twitter already, I suggest you do so because he has a lot of good thoughts about the music business in general. And uh, Nine Inch Nails, um, a few years back, um, cancelled the contract with a record label and decided to do everything by themselves, um, which is a great case for the for the the applicability of this, uh, uh, this kind of model also in the, in the uh, much higher mainstream levels of music. Um, I want to tell the story just quickly to compare about an album they did called Ghosts 1 to 4, which was released a couple of years back. Um, basically, as you can see, uh, Nine Inch Nails uh, produced this really, really um, luxurious product album um, which consisted of many different versions and, and so forth. But um, their strategy was brilliant because what they did was offer uh, different ways to obtain the music and different ways or different levels of, uh, of business engagement, like b different ways to obtain the music. Um, Nine Inch Nails also used a Creative Commons license uh, on the music, which meant that uh, two weeks before the, re the release, you could actually download the music for free, like the full album for free. Um, and uh, hundreds of thousands of people did that, of course. But uh, additionally, when the, when the album was then released and uh, the music was spread through maybe millions of fans all over the world, or at least music, uh, music fans were curious about Nine Inch Nails, uh, when they launched, they launched this uh, this um, variety of products, and I guess you can, like in the back, you probably can't see, but on top of the free download, they also had a, a download that cost five dollars, where you actually have a um, 
a like a PDF book uh, accompanying uh, the music, like a like a downloaded book with background material. If you wanted that, you had to uh, you had to pay five dollars. The next level was a double CD set, which cost ten dollars, which was uh, also um, the booklet and of course the CDs and the download. So a one step up on the on the grade of products. The next one was a seventy-five dollar deluxe edition package, which was, as far as I remember, it's a DVD and a CD and some more stuff, leading up to the three hundred dollars ultra deluxe package, which was um, some more stuff, but only available in twenty-five hundred copies. Um, so basically, what they did was give away the music and then offer all these different kinds of uh, products. Uh, at different uh, prices. Um, as uh, you probably can see if you're in the front, um, the 2500 uh, copy edition of the Ultra Deluxe uh, version was sold out. And not only that, <coughs> some statistics, that one week after the album was released, they could report over 750,000 sales on top of the free downloads. Um, amassing over 1.6 million dollars in sales. So this is what I'm talking about, the scale. Like, if you reach enough people and not uh, look at a download that doesn't lead to a sale as something that is lost, but rather an opportunity, statistically, to reach someone interested in making a purchase and then offering the right products that people want to purchase, then you have a platform to do business and also business on a really serious scale. And, um, and mind you that, uh, like I said, Nine Inch Nails doesn't have a record label. So, um, so these sales go directly into the, uh, the band's pocket. Um, it might seem funny that, that me as a record label guy promoting uh, you know, the idea of, of, of bands not having labels. But uh, I think you know, the role of the label is not, um, is not over. Like you can easily uh, be a label and uh, provide musicians with things or services that they're not able to do themselves. But you need to create a business that is not based upon limitation of technology that is uh, abundantly available and being used by people every day as a, as a basis for your, for your business model. You have to figure out, you know, uh, how, how can I help a band do things that a band cannot themselves? How can we use the internet? How can we create a relation? And how can we build a business on top of that relation? Thank you. If there are any questions, yeah. Anyone got questions? Yeah, hi. Uh, in fact, I've got a question about the scale issue. Um, even I, uh, as a non-rock fan, know about Nine Inch Nails, uh, so I can expect that for worldwide public, um, Nine Inch Nails don't have to do any marketing anymore. Um, I see they have a package about $300, which was sold out. Um, the average um, venue per uh, revenue per download was about $2, I see. So um, factoring in the $300, and I don't know about the, um, about the, the uh, amount of uh, the limitation of this uh, $300 offers, uh, I cannot see. Um, how the mass of downloads actually did anything to the uh, revenue, um, and on the other hand, you as a I don't know don't, I don't know your label and because of maybe it's Denmark label um, it's another thing. Um, you you seem to be pretty small. You said you are a niche product uh, for electronic music, so maybe uh, your marketing your marketing budget actually. Uh, your marketing budget should be calculated by uh, the losses you generate by giving away your um, music for free. So this this actually is your marketing bu uh, budget, which you could have uh, used in another way. Um, I don't think this is um, 
um, maybe a, a, an idea you can project to say uh, a non um, to, to unknown uh, label uh, which should, would want to be a large scale player for like pop music or whatever where you have this large mar market with um, lots of uh, competitors and uh, you have to generate some, some money to, to make a business uh, and if you give you, um, your music away for free um, I think it wouldn't work for pop music uh, maybe you can elaborate at that I think this is on I think I think um, I, I disagree because um, I think I think 1.6 million dollars is a pretty good platform to run any business but uh, I agree that it's hard to uh, to measure whether the free downloads provided by nine inch nails did um, like boost the sales or actually uh, made them smaller and uh, I guess we can you know argue about that forever uh, I think the point is that there are, you know you need to look at what people are willing to pay for because I think music is a feeling it's an experience and uh, you cannot sell a product at a price which people are not willing to pay and that's that's a fact so you need to figure out what are people willing to pay for and um, in order to like for us or for nine inch nails in order to reach potential buyers of the products then you need to make people aware of what that the product is available and uh, you can you, you can use a huge um, like advertising campaign to do that which is very common in the music business like TV advertisement but it's so expensive and it doesn't guarantee any kind of, of profit or, uh, or revenue whereas if you uh, if you go uh, uh, in, a, in another way and let music fans provide the marketing uh, the PR by sharing in their networks and thereby creating a more um, real demand if the music is good then you have a much more uh, in my opinion also for a label much more sustainable model which is based upon you know if people like the music or not so I don't really I don't really see the difference between pop music or some obscure uh, metal breakcore band or whatever I think that you know the the, the issue is that in order to make money, you need to provide products that people want to want to pay for, and uh, the music business are so um, are spending so many resources telling us that the only way to make profit from music is from record sales, or primarily at least, and that is not the case. I mean, you can easily build a, a, a business on on many different uh, many different kinds of products. And actually, one of the things that wasn't uh, on the Nine Inch Nails uh, product overview. Uh, which I'm pretty sure was there in the beginning was the, the, the top product which was basically having nine inch nails come to your house and do a concert which was insanely expensive like 50,000 whatever which was sold out in three minutes like imagine you don't have to do a lot of those shows like imagine if Lady Gaga had one of those and sold it for what like 10 million whatever you know there's, there's so, this is just an example of, of, uh, of being creative about what people are willing to pay for. It's a, it's a supply and demand. And the demand for music that costs money is zero. That's just the way it is. You need to provide something extra. I hope that uh, answers some of your question. Well, that's uh, basically just what I meant. Um, if you have nine inch nails and you can uh, generate mu uh, generate uh, money by selling your concert at home, uh, that's great. But if you're an unknown artist and um, yeah, what should you sell? I mean, you can sell T-shirts for maybe five dollars, but who wants to to uh, buy a T-shirt for someone you don't know? Um, with uh, those five, five like, uh, we did that, and we sold tons of T-shirts. Yeah, sure, <laughs> but you had a great marketing campaign by uh, giving this push in the in the blogs and uh, the media. But yeah, yeah, this but, is but we've one, been. We, one oh, time. sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but we've been doing the same for subsequent albums as well. Well, we didn't have the the media attention, so um, I can only encourage to experiment. I'm not saying that our model is perfect or in any way the way to go. I'm just uh, trying to inspire 
a different angle towards uh, making the music business. Test. Um, I guess uh, I have a good example for uh, uh, becoming famous. Um, do you know Linkin Park? Linkin Park, do you know Linkin Park? Yeah, everyone uh, knows Linkin Park. They started in 1989 or 1999 in, in this years. And um, in the, before that, they were very unfamous. And they started uh, to uh, give free downloads of the album Hybrid Theory uh, on the internet. And uh, they uh, told the local records uh, to the people to do that. And um, overnight, they became famous. And this is an example for becoming famous. Um, do you think that this kind of experience or this kind of experiment... Okay. Sorry. Do you think that this kind of experience or this kind of projects could be also transported to other... Um, markets, not just music market, but also, I don't know, um, uh, software or kind of uh, selling actually products, uh, material products, not just... Uh yes, actually, uh, I, as a Creative Commons uh, affiliate, I do a lot of talks uh, entirely about Creative Commons and uh, present a lot of uh, examples from different areas, film, photography, books. Um, for instance, with books, a good example is uh, an American science fiction author called uh, Cory Doctorow. Uh, who is uh, published by a publisher called Tor, which is a, a high-ranking um, big house uh, publisher. But he releases his books under a Creative Commons license uh, and differentiates between uh, ebook and uh, paper book. Um, so basically, the ebook is given away and uh, the paper book is, uh, is available for, uh, for money, of course. And uh, for him, uh, his, his books uh, reach the New York Times bestseller top 10 uh, pretty much every time, regardless of the digital product being available for free. So his idea is, is somewhat similar, that he uh, uses the, the free book to reach new readers, and then a percentage of that, that huge amount of, of uh, curious people and readers of the ebook all over the world are, are interested in buying an extra product. So that product is usually a book, a paper book, if you want that, but also I know he does a lot of talks about digital culture and things like that and is very good at it. So, you know, performing, even if he's an author, is also part of his portfolio of products. And uh, he's living a good life. <laughs> I mean, he, he's talented and, and still not working against the internet, but rather embracing it. Um, there are several uh, examples from movies as well giving away the music, uh, the movie, and then uh, being uh, getting um, commercial deals to be displayed in uh, movie th uh, cinemas and, and so forth. So if you go onto the Creative Commons website, uh, which is creativecommons.org, there's a big database of uh, examples from pretty much any kind of creative genre about uh, uh, projects and, um, and uh, people from all over the world who use this model in different variations. So I, I can uh, only encourage you to check that out. It's very inspiring. Um, you place a lot of emphasis on offering additional products and I wonder uh, what do you think about the option of just support this artist? I've downloaded your music, now I know I like it, I'd like to pay. I don't need a t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. And I, I, you know, I wish I actually mentioned this in the presentation because of course we had a donate button as well. And I know more and more bands have that. Um, and, and that works really well. Like a lot of, the pe a lot of people uh, enjoy the, the direct relation with the artist and want to appreciate that by giving a couple of euros or like we've had people giving 25 euros for just just saying thank you so much for you know creating a different atmosphere around being a music fan so I think that donations is a hugely underestimated area um, because it turns uh, the idea around that we've all been brought up with if you want something you have to pay for it but all of a sudden, when you get it for free, then you have to decide, do I actually want to give something back? And usually, if you have a really great experience with music, especially even a concert or you know, something like that, then you feel like, how can I, how can I show my appreciation? And that is usually, you know, that can be done through a donation or by picking a pro up a product. 
but the note donation, especially with smartphones becoming more and more easy to pay with, could uh, be a huge area of of, uh, of music business for a band that performs well and and have a, a, a talent of some sort. So, I, good point indeed. Um, do you think that your model would be more successful for a really major artist such as Madonna or Lady Gaga than the traditional music industry model that they currently follow? Um, hard to tell. I mean, I think, I think that every band or every label needs to come up with their own model. Um, there's no uh, one size fits all. But I think, you know, Lady Gaga, as an example, is already being downloaded illegally in probably millions already. So why not, why not, you know, you know, take advantage of all those millions of people interested in their music and encouraging them to spread it even further? I mean, it might be hard for her to reach higher levels than she's already at, but like lower-ranking uh, bands could take advantage of that to conquer new, uh, new uh, territories. I think. Um, and I, I, I think that it would be immensely interesting to see the reaction of the fans of a huge band um, being given that kind of opportunity with their favorite band. Like it would be doing an, an opposite Metallica, like not suing your fans, but saying we really appreciate that you like our music, and we want to encourage you to help other people like it as well. So, uh, in my opinion, I would say yes to your question. Thank you, Christian, for the inspiring talk. What we learned is that we have to support the small record labels, <laughs> donate, and make them be, become friends with uh, musicians through this. <laughs> um, we're done with the morning session. Please make sure if you're interested in Paulo Coelho's... Oh, one more. Let me just add, I have some download cards if you want to check out some of the music we do. So come up and get one of the free, of course. Thanks. So if you, if you want to um, hear the Paolo Coelho keynote speech, it's starting at 12 at the main stage. See you in the afternoon. <laughs>